So I've done a few videos recently about protecting yourself as a filmmaker from various theories of liability that might get asserted against you based on your film. Uh, so far, I've talked about defamation and misappropriation of name or likeness. In this video, I'm going to talk about a related legal theory that's called invasion of privacy. Uh, it's important for filmmakers and not just lawyers to understand this concept, particularly in the context of indie filmmaking, because it's rare for an indie filmmaker to have the financial resources to be constantly in contact with a lawyer about the decisions that they're making uh, when they're producing their movie. In other words, it usually costs hundreds of dollars an hour for an independent filmmaker to consult with a lawyer and have them draft documents or something else. And it's unusual for an independent film to have the budget to allow the filmmaker to be constantly doing that. If a lawyer is going to be involved, they usually come in to help prepare contracts before production, uh, or they may help after post-production when it comes time to get distribution for the film. You probably aren't going to be calling the lawyer when you're on set or when you're in the editing room to ask them questions, or at least doing that would be quite a luxury in the indie film context. So when you're making your film, it's helpful to have some kind of independent understanding of ways you can at least try to protect yourself from liability. And that's why we're talking about trying to minimize your risk uh, of liability under this concept of false light. Uh, before we get into these issues, I'll make two disclaimers because, of course, we lawyers can never really resist disclaiming things. And the first disclaimer is that this is not legal advice, because if I were going to give you legal advice, I would need to understand your specific situation and your specific needs. And right now, I'm just a lawyer talking to you on the internet. Uh, the second disclaimer is that this video is going to deal with issues of United States law. So if your film is being made outside the United States, or uh, you were distributing the film outside of the United States, this discussion might not apply to you. So what is invasion of privacy? Uh, the name of this legal theory sounds pretty straightforward, but like all things law related, there are nuances that it's important to understand. Um, there are really three different branches of this concept of invasion of privacy, which the courts have labeled as intrusion, public disclosure of private facts, and portraying someone in what's called a false light. Uh, some people see misappropriation of name or likeness as another branch of invasion of privacy. Uh, that's a concept that I covered in a previous video on this channel, if you want to check that out. Uh, I'll talk about these three legal theories that fall under this umbrella of invasion of privacy now, and the kind of steps that you can take to try to protect yourself from liability under them. Uh, first, let's talk about intrusion. Uh, intrusion effectively means that the defendant, that is the person who's being sued, intruded into a space where the plaintiff reasonably expected privacy, or they acquired information about the plaintiff that the plaintiff reasonably expected would be kept private. The plaintiff, that is the person who's filing the lawsuit, has to prove two things to show intrusion. The first is that the defendant intentionally intruded into a private place or they obtained private information. And second, that the defendant's conduct would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. Let's talk about an example of this from the film context. Uh, there was a case where Kiara Bellin, a model, uh, appeared in a fashion show that was part of a reality TV series called Shahs of Sunset. I think this was back in the, in the 2000s. Allegedly unbeknownst to Bellin, uh, the film crew shot her practically naked in the dressing area, and that footage was aired on the show. A court held that Bellin's case could go to trial because assuming that what she was alleging was true, the film crew intruded on her privacy by entering her dressing room and filming her without her consent. And doing that would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. Now, how do you protect yourself from liability for intrusion? Uh, the first step, which I talk about all the time, is to make sure, to the extent you can, that everyone in your film signs an agreement that allows you to use their name and likeness and any of the footage that you shot in the movie. Uh, if you're filming a documentary and you're going to interview someone in their home or about a personal issue, uh, make sure that they've signed a release that clearly states that you can do that and allows you as broad a license as possible to use the footage that you shoot. In other words, the usual language about uh, in perpetuity and throughout the universe and in any and all media, like in this example clause that I'm showing you right now. The more difficult questions about intrusion come up when you're not able to get the consent of the subject of, of the person who you're filming. But there are a few situations where it's clear that filming someone, even without their permission, is not going to be considered intrusion under the law. The first situation I'm talking about comes up when you're filming someone in a public place. Uh, if they're in a public place, they don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, regarding what they're doing or what they're talking about. There was a case where two NBC producers posed as potential investors in a company that was selling access to 1-800 and 1-900 phone numbers, and they met with a salesman from the company at a restaurant and recorded the conversation. 
Uh, they later included excerpts from the conversation in a news report about investment scams. The court found that the company's intrusion claim couldn't proceed to trial because the conversation was recorded in public. It was at a restaurant where they were surrounded by people. Uh, second, it helps if the person who you're filming voluntarily put themselves into the public eye. That doesn't just mean they need to be a movie star or a professional athlete. They could be someone who's highly placed in the government, for instance. Uh, for example, in one case, ABC shot footage of a judge leaving his home and used it in a news broadcast about uh, Los Angeles-based judges who basically had bad reputations with attorneys. The court found that the judge's case could not go to trial based not only on the fact that the film crew didn't physically enter the judge's property, but also on the fact that he voluntarily took on a highly placed position in the government. He, he put himself into the public eye by voluntarily choosing to become a judge. Uh, third, a corporation or some other type of legal entity doesn't have a right of privacy. Only individual people do. For example, there was a case where some ABC reporters secretly recorded a doctor talking about the cancer testing practices at his clinic. Uh, the doctor sued ABC. He said that this was intrusion. The court said that because the doctor was only talking about the activities of his clinic and nothing revealing about his personal life, the secret recording was not intrusion. In other words, any information that was revealed by the doctor was about the clinic, and the clinic, because it was a corporation, didn't have any right to privacy. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about public disclosure of private facts. Uh, in other words, this is when the defendant makes public facts that the plaintiff reasonably expected would be kept private. Uh, to be more specific, the plaintiff has to show first that the defendant uh, disclosed the facts in question publicly, that is, in a manner accessible to the public, and a film or TV show or, or video that's on the internet or something like that would certainly qualify uh, in this regard. Uh, number two, that the facts that were disclosed were actually private, that is, they were kept confidential by the plaintiff. They, they made an effort to keep them a secret, in other words. Uh, and third, that the disclosure would be offensive to a reasonable person. Uh, as I did with intrusion, I'll make a couple of observations about how you can avoid liability under this type of legal theory. Uh, first, you can't be sued for publicly disclosing facts that the plaintiff himself or herself already made public. Uh, for example, Viacom distributed a TV show called Bands on the Run, which was a reality TV show about unsigned bands competing for a record deal. The plaintiff, who was a member of one of the bands, alleged that the film crew followed her into a nightclub bathroom and filmed her kissing a man there, and that this was a public disclosure of private facts. Uh, the court disagreed with her because she had already publicly kissed the same man on the street and in a bar. So the fact that she was romantically involved with this guy was not a private fact, and so Viacom didn't publicly disclose any private facts about her. Uh, second, you can't be liable under this theory for disclosing what are called newsworthy facts, that is, facts that are a matter of public interest. This doesn't just apply to facts about important political issues. It also applies to facts about issues that you might consider kind of frivolous, like celebrity gossip, for instance. Uh, for example, uh, Christiane Carafano, who, who was an actress in uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine for a while, sued a dating site for allowing someone to publish her home address on it. Uh, it may sound a little bit surprising, but the court said that her address was actually newsworthy, uh, and therefore this was not a public disclosure of private facts, or at least not one that uh, the law would allow you to take action under, because the general public is interested to know where celebrities live. I guess it makes sense on some level. I mean, after all, for whatever reason, people go on bus tours of streets where the guides point out where the stars live. Third, the facts that are disclosed have to be more than just embarrassing. They really have to involve intimate details of people's private lives. Uh, for instance, there was a guy named Matthew Hogan who worked as a ticket sales executive for the LA Rams football team. And he sent his friend who was named Matt Weymouth uh, a private text message making negative comments about a player for the Rams, Patrick Chung. Uh, Weymouth then sent the text to Chung, who posted it on his Instagram account with hundreds of thousands of followers. Uh, Hogan sued Weymouth for public disclosure of private facts, uh, that is, disclosing his text message to the public. The court said that the mere fact that Hogan sent this trash-talking text message about Chung wasn't an intimate enough fact about Hogan to permit Hogan to bring a lawsuit. In other words, it wasn't an intimate detail about his private life. It was just a text message where he was making negative comments about someone else. And so that wasn't considered to be sufficiently private. Uh, next, let's talk about this concept of false light. Uh, I made a video earlier about protecting yourself from defamation liability. 
And this legal theory of false light is kind of similar to defamation. Uh, specifically, portraying someone in a false light means making a statement about them that, although it's true, has misleading and damaging implications. Uh, just like with the other two legal theories that we've talked about, the plaintiff has to prove that the truthful statement that the defendant made would be offensive to a reasonable person. Here are a couple of points uh, that I think it's important to keep in mind about avoiding liability for false light. Uh, first, merely suggesting that someone has a few character flaws isn't enough to be highly offensive to a reasonable person under this legal concept. Uh, for example, there was an army sergeant who claimed that the main character in the movie The Hurt Locker, Will James, was based on him, and he said that the movie portrayed him in a false light. Uh, specifically, he said that the movie depicted him as obsessed with war and death and suggested that he was a bad father. Uh, the court didn't agree with that description of the Will James character and noted that the character, uh, even though he had some flaws, uh, misses his son and he shows compassion to some Iraqis he comes across in doing his duties. So the movie's depiction of James, which the plaintiff said was based on him, uh, wasn't highly offensive. Uh, second, because false light is an offshoot of this idea of invasion of privacy, the statement that's made by the defendant needs to be about some aspect of the plaintiff's private life. Uh, for instance, you may remember the recent Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit. Uh, at a chess tournament scene in that series, an announcer refers to a real-life female chess champion, Nona Gaprindashvili, and says that she had never faced men. Uh, as it turned out, that wasn't true. She, uh, Geprindashvili actually did play chess against several male champions and had won. Uh, but when she sued Netflix, claiming that the series portrayed her in a false light, the court dismissed her claim. The court reasoned that even if it had been true that she never played against men, revealing that fact wouldn't have disclosed any private information about her. She was a well-known chess champion, and it was a matter of public record whether she had played against men after all. Uh, so it's not enough for a film or TV show or video to give people a false impression of a person who's featured or discussed in it. Uh, the film has to actually invade their privacy to give the plaintiff some ability to hold the filmmaker liable. So I hope that all that was helpful to you in understanding how to protect yourself from liability for invasion of privacy. Uh, if you have any other questions that I didn't answer in this video, please feel free to put them in the comments section below. Also, I would ask that you like this video and subscribe to this channel if you like the content that you're seeing so I can keep providing this kind of content to enterprising young filmmakers such as yourself. And thanks for watching.